two months ago, I was going to put the chickens up like I do every night, and they all come running and following me. And she was just down, and she wouldn't get up. And I thought, well, that's weird. And so I went over and just gently walked over to her and said, can you get up? And she just looked at me and did that. And she couldn't get up. I tried, picked her up and I just tried to set her down gently and she just collapsed. And so uh, evidently she injured her tendon or a muscle, pulled a muscle. I'm not sure what she did, but I um, brought her in the house and she stayed in Tommy's office for a couple of days and I fed her, you know, oatmeal. And there's a, uh, I take this stuff called Zeal uh, and it's got turmeric in it and uh, you know, ashwagandha. It's got all these wonderful uh, herbs and stuff in it and foods. And so I thought, well, it's good for me. It helps my inflammation, so I give it to the chicken. So I gave, started giving her the zeal in little syringes two or three times a day. And uh, she started getting better. And uh, a lot of TLC. And next thing you know, well, hey, that's Dixie. You know Dixie. <laughs> but the next thing you know, the, she, was, uh, she was walking better. Even though she was kind of like hop along, I called her hop along Cassidy kid, because she still kind of hop along, but she was doing just fine. And then a couple days ago, she was down again. I went to put them up in the chicken coop and she was sitting down right there at the uh, edge of the coop. <sighs> Before I went vegan, I loved Chick-fil-A sandwiches, you know, chicken sandwiches, I mean, as much as anybody. And I would come home and with a sandwich, a chicken sandwich, and I'd have my chickens at my feet. And uh, not everybody gets the uh, tactile, you know, experience of living on a ranch like this going vegan. You know, um, I started having all these conflicts in my mind, in my soul, that I would be eating a chicken and loving this one, you know, and we never ate our own animals. Even the cows, we never slaughter our own cows. We always bought the pretty pink packages, you know, at the grocery store. Um, and she's going to sleep. And um, I remember vividly when I was working on her leg in the kitchen and giving her a little syringe of that, that zeal. I remember vividly that I was working on her and I got the gut feeling of how I used to eat chicken legs when I was working on her leg and I just started crying at the sink. Just started crying. I mean, I, I mean, I was deep, guttural, horrifying, just sobs because I was working on her leg and realizing that, you know, everybody eats them. Never even thinks a thing about it. A friend of mine called me up. I was working shift work and I was tired. And he goes, hey, come out here. There's this girl that wants to meet you. And I said, yeah, you're lying. You always are. And he was, and I went anyway. And uh, anyway, I met her. Yeah, Renee's an incredible person. She's, uh, she's always done incredible stuff. One of the early things I saw was she was in a play in Houston, two or 3,000 people, uh, you know, threw her the roses on the stage and all that stuff because she was the main singer. And uh, she was right on the edge of making it. And it was a wild ride. You could write a book about her, you know, music career. And for whatever reason, it, it never happened. Oh, Shannon Doe. I long to see you. Whoa, you rolling river. Oh, Shenandoah, I long to see you across the wild Missouri. Herman's very soothed about music. And so I sing to him all the time. And I see his eyes change when I sing to him and I watch his ears perk up. I watch the hair go down on his back. You know, he 
he was on a concrete floor um, at that kill shelter. It was not nice. He had barking dogs all around him. And so he was very stressed when we got him. Very. Right over there, we're building his fences and his home. His little feet are gonna touch the earth for the first time in a long time. Just gotta get him out of here. I want him out of here so bad. I... Herman's owner had passed away. He had been left for six months. The kids came and cleared out the house, cleared out the furniture, got the dog and the cat, but left the pig. And Herman had been fending for himself, so the animal control officers had picked him up, brought him into the shelter. And Renee, God love her, she's a week out from this event. Right? She has spent all the money she's got on this project. Her husband, at the time we talked on the phone, her husband was out in the midday sun mowing and shoring up fences to contain the bull calves that didn't go to slaughter. And she said, I don't know, Salise, I don't know if I can, a pig, I mean, I've never dealt with a pig. I, would, I don't even have a place to put him, I don't know. When that big storm came through, Everybody lost fence. Lots of Lake Jackson, lots of Danbury. So we got tons of calls and then she called me with this. I couldn't tell her no. And I think we exchanged 40 or maybe 50,000 emails about how we were gonna get this done and who was gonna hold him, who was gonna pick him up, what were we gonna feed him, how were we gonna lure him, who was gonna house him, how are we gonna get his pen built, how are we gonna raise the money to, to build the pen. And it was just like this beehive of activity and I, I came to have this enormous respect for Renee because she really is a, she would just get it done. The way I look at it is, comes around, goes around. You do something good, somebody returns the favor eventually. So I always try to help out. And Renee does the same. When she started talking about sanctuary, I didn't tell her, but I was thinking, I guess I'm gonna get a divorce because uh, this is ridiculous. Uh, it's not gonna work in Texas and uh, she wanted to try it. And uh, Renee is a very strong-willed person and uh, you can't tell her not to do something. I wasn't trying to you know, open up a sanctuary in the state of Texas, that's not been my goal in life. My goal was to be a, a famous country and western singer, hello. That's what I thought I was gonna be one day, you know, and, and that didn't happen. And I married a farmer. He's worked hard all his life. He bought this place to supplement his retirement. We hadn't been making any money. Balloon notes were coming due on tractors. He's needing to buy another rake. And now I'm telling him, oh heck no, you ain't taking that red trailer up the road anymore. We're not selling any more calves. You send that red trailer up the road one more time, I'm following it. I'll go to the slaughterhouse if I have to. And it was a process for me because, I mean, I love my husband. I didn't want to just say, you know, too bad, you go up the road. What I've been here is a catalyst for my husband to see a way that he's never been shown before because his history, his culture, his way of viewing the world is so grounded in tradition fourth generation cattle rancher. His great grandpa herded cows from San Antonio by horse with spurs and they had their own brand. And Tommy still has that. That means something to him to restore that history. So this is Tommy's heritage. For Tommy to say, um, you know, none of that meant anything is, doesn't come easy. But watching his wife change watching his wife draw the line in the sand, watching his wife pull in all these people from around the world that are supporting us to, to build a sanctuary in the state of Texas is changing my husband. That's what's changing my husband. I kind of laughed at her and said it'll never work and uh, she has actually put me in my place now because the vegan world came to her rescue. I mean, she started meeting people that allied with her. It was incredible, and I started watching it, and I couldn't believe what was going on. Uh, I still, it's kind of like a dream. Uh, they're incredible. Uh, if she has a problem, 
somebody in her network helps her out and it magically disappears. I think that we all have the power to change and to transform. And we see that every single day at Mercy for Animals. Someone whose family owned a cattle ranch decides to give up everything that they knew to be familiar to become a vegan animal rights activist. We see every single day the power that compassion has. Is it not better to light a candle than to curse the darkness? All the darkness in the world cannot put out the light of a single candle. I believe another world is possible, and on a quiet night, I can hear her breathing. It will be difficult, I know, but do not be afraid. Remember Mahatma Gandhi's words. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. The brutes and the bullies have been Goliath, but David is coming. Maybe he's in this room. Maybe he's one of you. And if not you, who? And if not now, when? Here's my daughter, Genesis Bullet. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Genesis and I'm eight years old. I am vegan and an activist. Like my uncle Cesar Chavez was. I went vegan because I don't believe animals should be put in slaughterhouses and circuses. People don't have to eat animals to live. All my favorite foods like pizza and mac and cheese, I can still eat in a vegan version. I became an activist to protest for what's right to show kids they have a voice. I protest circuses and other places that imprison animals. I help people who are blinded. They don't know what's happening to the animals. I also leaflet to give information on what's happening and now to go vegan. I even talk to my friends. My goal is to get them to go vegan. I'm here for a purpose. My purpose is to get the whole world to go vegan. Thank you for helping me. Peace. <sighs> Oh my God. Okay, okay. She wasn't even four years old. She always had chicken nuggets. That was her favorite meal at the time. And so I read all the parenting books in the world because it was my first child. And a lot of books said if that's all they want to eat and they're picky, just let them eat chicken nuggets or whatever it is all day. And I just said, okay, well, I believe the commercials, the white meat, and you know, if you have milk with it or apples and the whole kids' meals and all that. And I would give it to her because it made her happy. And at least I thought it made her happy because I believe the advertisements and it didn't make her happy. And she just finally told me one day, she said, hey, mom, where do we get our food from? And I said, you know, we get it from the grocery store. And she said, no, that's not where we get it from. And she, she knew. And so I just, at that moment, I knew I had a tough decision to make. Do I tell her the truth? Or do I just, you know, keep playing it off? And just my instincts came, kicked in. And I said, I'm going to tell her the truth. Because I always told myself as a parent, if my ch child asks me something, I'm going to give them the straight truth. Because, you know, that's what's needed. And I told her we kill animals for the food that she was eating, and she was devastated. And I didn't even know she knew what death meant at that age, and she just knew deep down inside. And she said, well, we have to kill, what is it? I said, well, chickens and cows, and I was explaining, you know, beef is from cows, like the burger, that's not beef, that's a cow. And, you know, the chicken is the actual animal, the little bird, and she said, you know what, I don't ever want to eat this again. One of the great things, but the maddening things about being an animal rights activist is, for the most part, we never have to convince people to care about animals. People already love animals. We just have to convince people to understand that the dog they love is emotionally the same as the cow they eat. You know, that's the disconnect. So it's aligning people's already existing love for animals with their actions. And so I look at someone like Genesis, and to me she just seems like she's, she's living her beliefs in a way that most people don't. You know, I mean, how many parents 
have had the experience with their kid where like their four-year-old, their six-year-old, their eight-year-old, their nine-year-old is eating a hamburger and says, mom, what is this? And the mom says, that's a hamburger. Well, where does it come from? A cow. And all of a sudden the child's horrified. And the child almost has to like be taught to move past their horror. And one of our jobs is to remind them that no, their horror was justified. You know, the eight-year-old who's horrified at eating a hamburger, that's a legitimate response. It's a justified response. The 18-year-old, the 28-year-old who eats the hamburger as if there's no consequences for the environment, for them, or for animals, that's the mistake. This is my bunny. Her name's Charlotte. And my, my mom's friend and my friend named Nina gave it to me. And this is very special to me because it only has one foot. And I'm on a mission to find its other foot. Somebody has it. And I just have to find its foot because, like, I don't think it's right just to have one foot. She told me about how the, the bunny, it wasn't like a natural bunny. It had been, like, ran through the mill, but she really was interested in it. And then when she brought it home and showed me it, and it was it's kind of ugly, but <laughs> but it has character that it, it made sense to me um, as far as what animals go, that not all of them look the same, but they all need love in their own way, you know. She's just a sweet girl. <laughs> just a sweet girl, <laughs> yeah. I don't feel that I shouldn't love her just because she has one foot. All animals should be loved. They shouldn't be tortured. Charlotte is awesome because each time I'm crying or sad, she's always there for me. And if I need a pal, she'll be there. One day I was nursing my baby and she came and she looked at her sister when I was nursing and she said, Mom, where do we get milk? And I said, oh man, I'm going vegan today. I already knew it was, it was going to happen, it was a wrap. So we went vegan that day. From that point on, we never looked back. But I did look back a couple times for a chocolate bar and she caught me. So, <laughs> so when she caught me with the chocolate bar, she said, Mom, she put her hand on her hip. I said, uh-oh, I'm about to get lectured. She said, if you can't handle it, I can. Don't think you have to go vegan just because I am. She goes, I can do it on my own. Don't ever underestimate your own voice. When you speak with kindness and sincerity, people will listen. And every single leaflet that Genesis or I hand out has a potential to change one person's life forever. So don't ever forget, we just gotta plant as many seeds as humanly possible. Some of them will grow, some of them will not, but we just gotta you know, keep fighting, keep being out there, keep educating the masses. You cannot get the truth from a corporation. We have to hit the streets, provide this information, and people will respond to this message of kindness. So if she can get this, how can adults not get it? And that's why I'm so inspired by her. On her first day of school, she wore a Love Animals, Don't Eat Them t-shirt. And her mother asked her after the first day of school, did, they, did kids make fun of you or say anything during lunch? And Genesis says, yeah. And her mom's like, well, what did they do? She's like, oh, well, they waved hot dogs in my face, they rubbed salami on my cheeks. And uh, her mom is like, well, did you cry? And Genesis is like, yeah, I cried. And then her mom's like, did you cry because they were making fun of you? And Janice is like, oh, no. I cried because they didn't understand that they're hurting animals. The average person eats about 7,000 animals in their lifetime, if you include fish. So just spending 10 minutes handing out those 100 leaflets, that's going to save, over the course of time, thousands of animals from a life of horror we couldn't even begin to imagine. But every day we go out and leaflet, hand out a few thousand leaflets. We're getting tons of people to go vegan, others to go vegetarian. We're getting people to uh, be aware of these issues, a first step. That's why uh, the first step of any revolution is education, and that's what me and Genesis do all the time. At first, I wasn't really for it, just because I know some, some adults can be very rude to children and adults, vice versa. But um, as, as she did it and her mom's where I, I think it's hard to be mean to a child like that. Uh, I just kind of have a trust that they kind of see like a light in her that maybe it might happen to other people, but I just don't think it, hap it would happen to her. Otherwise, I wouldn't have her do it. It's just that she has, she's so, um, 
it, it, she opens up people. She makes people feel comfortable. So even the person that planned on being mean or usually is rude, they, it's a weird thing that they're nice to her. She's just Genesis, just like her name, the beginning, just Genesis. She's something new, something that we haven't seen before. <laughs> it's just you don't see the stuff that she does. I've never seen kids do those things. So, so I'm comfortable with it, yeah, I'm comfortable with it. When kids are young, they say, I want to be so-and-so when I get older. Well, I want to be Genesis when I get older. <laughs> because just her spirit and her compassion and to wake up every day and see her here at my house, it's just awesome. And to see how it spreads out to the whole family. Everybody you know, has a lot of compassion for animals, for other humans, for homeless. Like we'll even see homeless people and my little boy will cry if we can't give him a dollar. And you know, it's all started with Genesis just reminding us that we need to be a little more compassionate, not just to other humans or to our family members, but to everyone else in the world, and including animals. Children have an, a natural connection with other animals. And then as time goes, we become acculturated to accept certain things that don't feel right. We come to believe that it's okay for cruelty to become normal. And we become adulterated, in a sense, instead of following our instincts and our humane intuition and our natural empathy. And so I think holding on to that childhood perspective and connection with animals and nature is very valuable. And it's a beautiful thing when children who are young and hold on to that continue with it throughout their life. I knew that something wasn't right. I knew that I wasn't drinking like other people. I was passing out, getting alcohol poisoning, blacking out, getting sick, drinking before school, things that normal 10th graders don't quite do. I had a lot of trauma in my life, and I think that's a common thread with people that develop some substance abuse problems. The divorce and not having a present a father and our family was ripped apart. Alcohol, that was the elixir that helped kind of make things feel a little bit better. I would go into 7-Elevens and stores like that and literally steal the alcohol from the coolers, put it down my pants, and then go drink the alcohol by myself behind the building. After high school, I started taking trips to South Florida, Miami, South Beach more, and I started getting into heavier drugs on a regular basis. After that year or so, I started getting more into uh, to cocaine. And by the time I was 25, I was uh, a daily drinker and user and cigarette smoker and very unhealthy. and. I honestly should not be here right now. I should be, I should be dead. I did almost overdose many times. Uh, I've been in nasty car accidents where the people have come to the scene of the accident and they've seen the vehicle and they said, you don't need to go to the hospital. I've uh, committed felonies that I've gotten away with plenty of times. I just acted, you know, very immorally and very recklessly and you know, I just didn't care. I didn't, I didn't care. It was almost like it was a, a cry for help. It was just like, save me. I called my brother and I called him in the middle of the night and I was crying to him on the phone. And I, apparently I said that I needed help. <laughs> I still to this day don't recall that, but that's what he said and I believe him love my brother to death and so <laughs> I went to go visit and my sister was there, my brother was there, my sister-in-law was there, my mother was there and my little niece was there and we were sitting around and talking and and then all of a sudden the tone kind of changed a little bit and <laughs> and I think it was my mom who said you know well the real reason we wanted to all get together today and talk to you <laughs> is we wanted to talk to you about your your problem that you have. 
And so I was there with all my loved ones, and they all went around the room, and they told me how I affected them, which I didn't think I did. I, I thought, I'm only affecting myself. This is my life. Let me do what I want. You do what you want. I didn't realize that's the selfishness and self-centeredness of, of um, this affliction. So they all went around and told me, and I was blown away. And they said, we'll help you if you help yourself. So I checked myself into a 28-day uh, rehab. You know, like they say, uh, a huge tree can grow from a tiny mustard seed. And that's, that's where I began. People want to ask me so many questions about ultra running or being vegan or, or this and that. It's like, it's really simple. It's just simple, you know? It's uh, just about the love, really. And that's, that's really the void that was filled. Good job, buddy. Oh. <laughs> wow. That was such a good Hey, Goosey. Hey, boy. How are you? It was such a nice surprise to see him come up to me. His whole body was, it wasn't just like his tail was wagging. It was like his whole body was just wiggling back and forth. And, oh, it just really warmed my heart. The, the relationship between dogs and humans is quite profound. I didn't have the responsibility to have my own pets in the past. So the time was right now to get a dog and to be a vegan you realize more and more how much animals have been used as commodities we don't need to use them for money realizing that this animal has such feelings and such love you think just dogs are like that or other animals too are cows like that are pigs like that you know so that was uh, quite a, a shift for me Hey, Jen. Hey, Ian. How's it going? Good. How are you? Yeah, good. How was the race? Oh, it was really fun, but it was tough. I'm sure and you killed it. <laughs> I'm looking forward to a float, definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. The tank is all ready. You're in Floatarium. You can head on up. Sweet. Thank cool. you. You're welcome. See you in a bit. See ya. Ever since I jumped in the, the cab of that truck and started driving it, it's actually it's pretty cool. I feel pretty badass. It's a very big truck and it's very heavy as well. So it's not just the size of it, but to break it takes a while because it's like 13,000 pounds. It's, it's kind of cool getting up there and, and driving this big old truck. We live in the wine country. So, you know, this is our bread and butter around here. And there's so many wineries. I don't think anyone's ever physically counted them. There's too many to count. And so when you're looking at that big of a presence with wineries, it's just important to utilize the resource there. I mean, why not? The stuff is really good. So the best thing for me, and that's why I change up my menu all the time, is to just get in the kitchen and say, I wonder what this would be like if I added this to it. And this whole rap that vegan food has had about being tasteless, you know, it's, it's just a bad rap. I mean, people say to me all the time, oh, I've had vegan food. It's not very good, you know. And I'm like, yeah, me too. I've had bad vegan food too. <laughs> I mean, I've had bad pizza. If you care, I think, that the food is good. I really care that not only the food is good, but it's knee-buckling, that it's exceptional. And it's, you know, if I'm making something, I'll, I'll, 
I'll taste it and like, yeah, this is really good, but I want, my knees aren't buckling yet. I need, I need something to go, ah, yes. I think that people just need to come out and try it. The word vegan, they think fake and it's not. And the taste is just out of this world. And a, a lot of people say, you know, once they eat it, they're like, I, I don't even need to go out and have, you know, that hamburger from that place after I've eaten her food. So yeah. you just need to get over the idea that it's a fake food because it's not. And I would say too, that a lot of people have this impression that like, oh, she's a vegan or he's a vegan. They eat carrots, right? Or they eat celery. It's like, <laughs> no, food, real and good food. And you don't have to be vegan to come out and try vegan food. I noticed this older gentleman with his veteran's hat and all these pins and looking a little out of place, a little uneasy, you know, with, I'm not sure I recognize half the food on the menu. What is this? I'm not, you know, a little unease, a little unease there. I know you told me not to tell dad that it was vegan. But the daughter, urging him on, usually they got a, a partner in crime there. No, I have never tried vegan food before. Thank you. I have a general idea. It's non-meat, basically. It's pretty good. She was really worried today for me coming here uh, about vegan and uh, told me to eat something at home. Well, I didn't. And uh, I thought, you gotta have something, <laughs> you know. And I'm quite surprised, it was, it was very good. It is very good, I will finish it. I could use a napkin. In the evening, when I go by and I'm just walking by their table really quick and the daughter grabs my arm and pulls me over to the table and she's like, I've got to tell you, he's never had vegan food before and he loved it. And it's like, it, it's, it makes my heart proud because now vegan food is, is accessible, you know? It's not a weird out there thing. <laughs> Come on. As far as being an animal lover, it was nothing that at the time when we first met that it was anything that was on, out on. there. But now that she has a vegan food truck, she does a lot of uh, events for the SPCA and, and other organizations like that and donates to their cause. That's my favorite piece of that. My wife's a vegan, so that means no leather products, uh, no leather shoes, no leather belts, no leather handbags, nothing that's derived from animals whatsoever. And at first, when she brought this up, especially being a vegan, um, because of my ignorance of diet at the time, you're thinking, okay, where are you getting your protein? Where are you getting your calcium? Where are you getting all these vitamins and things like that? And it turns out, uh, nature in the plant form provides all that stuff. You just, you just have to eat a well-balanced diet. If you're wondering about, am I gonna get enough protein? Go out to the nearest rural area, pick the biggest bull you can find. Or go to a racetrack, find the biggest, strongest stallion you can see. Go to the zoo, look for the tallest giraffe, the biggest elephant. All of those animals got those rippling muscles entirely from plant foods. Those are vegans. So yeah, you know, now a pussycat is a meat eater, so it's not like eating a lot of meat is gonna make you big. Uh, you get plenty of protein from plants. Research is now clearly showing that a plant-based diet beats every other diet. And the federal policymakers are taking notice of that. If Jerry's uh, cooking a plant-based diet, I have no problem with that. 10 years ago, I would have gone out to uh, the store and bought some, bought some meat to, to add on to it, but, but not anymore. Now, it's, now that I'm starting to understand that 
you can get all these nutrients, you can get the protein, you can get everything you, you need from a uh, plant, plant-based diet, then the, the fears go away. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans are reformulated every five years to be the blueprint for what you're supposed to eat. That means every kid in school, every food assistance program, really every nutrition program is supposed to adhere to the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. They're a big deal. In the year 2000, we sued the U.S. Department of Agriculture because we found that six of the 11 members on the committee had financial ties to the meat industry, the milk industry, the, the egg industry. Uh, we won that lawsuit. That opened up the process dramatically. And ever since then, the guidelines have gotten better and better and better. To run a business, you, you, can't, be, you can't be sitting on your butt all day being tired. So you have to have uh, a balanced diet. And I think by her being a vegan, by having a plant-based diet, her energy levels are higher. She puts her mind on something and she goes for it. Since she started this, I haven't got to visit very much because she's been so overwhelmed. But I've been following her on the Facebook and, and it's been very interesting. I, I think I'm impressed. Good for her. That's wonderful. You know why? I can't claim to be a vegan by any means, but she has inspired me to change my way of looking at things and she has opened my eyes to some things that I did not know existed. They were trained gentle with kindness. They have no fear. You know, a lot of people go to their pasture for a horse and they run the other way. <laughs> they don't want you to be around them. These guys, they're okay with it. They're family, most definitely, most definitely. Uh, I've had him 23 years and he'll die on my property. I mean, he'll, he'll be here until he grows old and, and, and sees his last day, won't you? Yes. He was an accident. He wasn't on purpose, but we love him just the same. <laughs> about what Renee was doing out here for these animals and when the opportunity came up I knew she had all this going on it was kind of a time crunch but I felt like I had to be a part of it really she's doing a good thing out here you know and anytime that you get an opportunity to do something like this it's you know I try to jump on it okay, Carmen. yeah I'm sure we're probably gonna hang around to watch yeah we've put a lot of time and effort into this and this is gonna be his home and it'll make us feel really good to see him happy in it Oh, Herman, oh, Herman, we love you so much. We see your soul behind your eyes. We know you had it rough. Oh, Herman, oh, Herman, we you love go. you there so you much. We see your soul behind your eyes. We know you had it rough. What resonates with me with, with Renee is that she, you see the motto on my shirt. That's the motto of the shelter. Every animal matters, every single one. And for her, that, that is this personified. <laughs> Look, Houdini's meeting him for the first time. Aww. Okay, I'm the kids. He's already trying to convert me. <laughs> All right, Renee, I'm gonna get out of here. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> 
thank you for everything. I no appreciate problem. you. No problem. So much. I'll be back out here on Monday to take care of a few little things, okay? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You know, you know that you wouldn't be doing this project if you weren't going to go vegan. So, you do, do your research. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> None of us had any options for this pig. She was this pig's way out. But I just learned that that he apparently went into his house this morning at 9.30 when the gates opened here at 10. That's a beautiful story. If you are here to be part of the uh, show and watch the entertainment and the speakers, the only way we're gonna know you're here is if you're in the front, all right? I know we got vendors out there and that's important, but we wanna see who's here for a moment. I know, right? No two, three, one. 232? 233? 234? You got 234? All right, you won. All right, come on. 97 people showed up to buy tickets. And with those 97 people, uh, we raised about $8,300. I had people putting thousand dollars in my hand, cash. I had people putting hundred dollar bills in my hand. I, you know, just me walking around. Not to mention what happened in the office. Not to mention what happened afterwards. I mean, there's just there was an outpouring. I'm a surgeon, but I specialize in weight loss, so I do weight loss surgery and medical weight loss diets, and I teach people plant-based diets. The vegan diet works for diabetes, heart disease, cancer. What, do I have a bug in my hair? Uh, they don't even want to kill bugs, so. <laughs> um, and uh, it's just been, yeah, you know, for, it's just changed the way I treat people in medicine. It's, it's my first line of treatment. Our number one cause of death is heart disease. Heart disease is completely preventable. You do not have to have heart disease, even if you're genetically predisposed to it. If you eat a plant-based diet, you won't, or very, especially vegan diet, you're very unlikely to get a uh, get heart disease. And same with diabetes, same with certain types of cancer, same with obesity. This is all can be cured with diet. Children are not really attracted to eating meat. That's something that we kind of push on children. And we let them choose whatever they want, and um, pretty soon they decided they didn't want to eat animals. When they figured out, this one was like, isn't it weird that there's a chicken out in the farm and there's a chicken that you eat? And it was like, well, no, they're the same thing. And she was like, they're the same thing? And then that was, that was it for eating chicken. We are uh, an animal farm sanctuary becoming uh, the first ever beef cattle ranch to transition to a vegan farm sanctuary in the state of Texas. You know, so it doesn't surprise me that we don't have hundreds of people here today, honestly. But, <laughs> but you know, but it's coming. Oh, you just wait. It's coming. Texas consciousness is waking up. And what's really cool is these fine folks, I was talking to Joy the other day, and I was telling her what we do. And she said to me, Renee, you know, we, we have cows here, like Texas Longhorns. Sometimes the cows, the little babies, would go to FFA kids, and they fall in love with these cows. And if they go to auction, which most of them do, they do get sold, and they do go to slaughter. So... We are going to get to adopt Frosty, and Frosty is going to be our first ever Texas Longhorn here. He'll be out here in the pasture with Herman and the rest of the rowdy bunch. As she started making a sanctuary, I started reflecting back about my whole life and the way I thought about animals, and I was kind of relieved because now the, the if this I was thinking wow if this works uh, I can have a bunch of pet cows and I don't have to take them to market and Renee would say they're not pets they are individuals 
And I said, okay, we can have a bunch of individuals. Bullseye, how you doing, girl? How you doing? How you doing, girl? I wanted to go to a slaughterhouse and I wanted to see exactly what was happening there. And I wanted to do a little bit of filming. And so I asked a friend of mine, a close physician friend of mine actually, who I knew his uncle was the general manager of a large slaughterhouse. I asked him, just, I thought they would say no, but I asked anyways if there was any possibility that I could do that. And to my surprise, they said yes. Prior to being slaughtered, the animals were so desperately fighting for their lives. They were so moving around violently and jerking around that when they were supposed to be killed, they were really not even killed. Many times they were just injured or weakened. Actually, that's what I saw that happened most of the times with the cows, that they would hit a captive bolt more so down down the neck instead of in the head because probably because of the reason that it's not easy to hit them in a strategic point with those conditions. And so the animals would fall to the ground and um, they would put a shackle in the hind leg. And now these animals were still alive. The cows were still completely alive. And they were even making movements with her. They weren't as strong to walk up and leave the place, but they were still making movements and they were still conscious and their eyes were wide open. And then the slaughterhouse um, worker would put the shackle and they would be hanging by, their hang by the hind leg. And then uh, a, a worker would come up to like a platform so that he would be at the same level of the cow. And then he would get close to the cow and then he would cut off the legs of the cow, like from the, from the knee down, the three legs except for the leg from where uh, she was hanging from. And then the three legs would fall to the floor. And then he would come close to her again and lift up the tail of the cow. And from the very tip of the tail, he would make a vertical incision. I don't know how deep or superficial, but a vertical incision, and then put the object down, and then he would pull the skin of the pull the skin of the cow down, so that the cow's own skin was hanging next to her own head on both sides of her head, and then he would make an incision in her in her neck, and then blood would come gushing out, and she would start choking on her own blood. And then eventually, she would die. I went to the holding areas. First of all, I saw that these animals were really, really terrified. And somehow they all knew what was going on because they would start walking back and being afraid of us, uh, even, you know, even in the holding areas, because somehow they sensed that something wasn't right. I think, I think. But at the end of the holding areas visit, I saw some of the cows were housed individually, some of them were housed like in very large groups. I'm not sure why, but at the end, there was a cow that housed, that was housed individually. This was a huge, beautiful, completely white cow. And she was terrified. Like you could see that she was really, really anxious. She was, she was really afraid. I, I have a feeling that somehow they know. I don't know why they would know, but maybe they can smell the blood because it was right adjacent to the slaughterhouse. Maybe they can smell it, or I don't know. But she was really nervous. And we were at the end of the visit, so I asked the guy who was giving me the tour, if you want to call that, or the visit, who was with me. And I asked him if I could stay there with the cow. So he stayed with me, and we were talking with the cow for about 15 or 20 minutes. I was, he was just standing there. But um, she calmed down and I was even petting the cow and, and she really calmed down and she was in much better conditions. But then the next day, when I went to the actual slaughter facility and when I was filming all of these horrible things that I just told you, it came the turn of all of the cows, it came the turn of that white, beautiful cow to go through slaughter. And it was so much harder because the fact that this white cow wasn't, she didn't even fight back like the other cows. 
She could smell the blood. She could hear the other cows. She knew exactly what was going on. But for some reason, I think she thought that I was going to help her because she came, she, she even like positioned herself. Like they didn't have to shove her in too much. They, the workers were like shoving the other cows and the other cows were jumping on their, I mean, getting on their hind legs. They were trying to crawl the wall and this white cow, she just went straight up to me because I was about, about half a meter away from where their heads were with my camera. And she walked straight up to me and she was just staring at me. And the other workers were pushing her and then the door, the metal door closed behind her. And even with all of that, she was not fighting back. All what she was doing was with her eyes wide open, she was standing still and she was staring at me. She wasn't even blinking. Like she was begging for me to help her. Somehow she, she probably sensed that I didn't wanna you know, for for this for this to happen, and obviously, you know, obviously, I didn't want that to happen. Obviously, um, but it was so hard because she was just imploring for me to help her, and there was absolutely nothing that I could do. Don't give up. Just gotta focus and find some comfort within the discomfort. Okay, we're gonna work on some lateral movements, speed skaters. Okay, we're gonna go to the side, alternating legs. Okay, in five, four, three, two, one, go. Get a nice T position and hold them out. Four minutes beginning now. When those little voices start coming into your head to tell you to quit, tell you to give up, just like in life, when it gets tough, you don't give up. You can override that, push past, and come out on the other side. We'll be you guys up big time. One, two, three. <laughs> I met Yasin in Ithaca, New York, um, this quirky little town where I was on the faculty at Cornell and Yasin was living um, with his brother and sister-in-law um, kind of in the out, on the outskirts of the city. And he came to one of my yoga classes. Uh, I was teaching yoga at the time and that was the beginning. He kept coming back to the classes and he was really bad at yoga. <laughs> and he would come to the meditation classes as well. And he was worse at that because he needed like 10 props, blankets, pillows. Um, my teacher spent like 20 minutes just getting him comfortable because his body is so tight. He had long wavy hair and a ponytail and he was kind of bigger than he is now and and I started to think wow this guy keeps coming to these classes and he's really bad at it I wonder if um, he likes me we went away on a honeymoon to Costa Rica before we got married and then right after we got married we went to the farm sanctuary in upstate New York and we stayed overnight there and we had an amazing experience connecting with the animals. I also remember going on a vacation with him to some South American country, and they asked him, why don't you eat meat? You know, they didn't ask me, but for the man not to be eating meat in this South American country was really weird. And so Yasin said, um, because I don't want to hurt animals. And the waiters laughed at him. Um, and I thought that that was just so authentic um, and brave of Yasin to show that empathy to others. I think it was a big moment for him because it was one of the first times he had been challenged or asked uh, why. And he didn't, at that time, didn't say like all the health benefits. His immediate response was because of the animals. 
and that's really representative of the kind of person that he is. Not only are runners vegan, but they're actually performing at a high level. I think that is out there on the table now that you do get enough protein. That's not a question anymore. Us vegan runners kind of stick together and kind of know of each other and are kind of proud of each other when we do perform on a high level on a big stage. One thing uh, I really do enjoy is cooking for vegans and non-vegans in my home and seeing their eyes light up about how good it is and how full they feel. Because I think a lot of people have a misconception. They feel like they're not gonna get satiated or they're not gonna be filled up because they don't have a big hunk of meat to fill their belly. I love when people come over and they're just like, wow, that was an amazing dish. Oh, I feel so good. And it was all plant-based. Hey, before we start eating, I want to make a toast. I really uh, thank you guys for coming over and cheers to everybody. Yeah. Good luck this weekend. Thank you, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Run strong. After dinner the night before a race, I love to go out for a nice, slow shakeout run with my friends. The first time I met Yasin was a 50 mile race uh, just outside of Seattle called the White River 50 miler. And I was, you know, running along and all of a sudden this guy comes up to me and he starts talking my ear off like, hey, I went vegan, you know, you really inspired me. And he was just going nuts. I'm like, you know, who is this guy? And at the same time, I'm like, wow, he's really got an energy to him. And um, he, I thought, you know, would drop off eventually, but he just hung with me for the next like five miles up this brutal climb. And, you know, he had as much energy in his voice as he did in his heart and lungs. Yassine's just one of those charismatic, you know, runners and ultra runners were, were an interesting and odd bunch, but um, we also kind of like, you know, we can pick up wherever we left off. And I think that's, that's the beauty of our sport as well as a vegan diet. Um, you know, again, we're connected. Um, by a certain thread, and that is running and being vegan. Um, so it's always great to come back and, and just hang out and hang out as buddies and as if nothing, <laughs> and as, as if no time has really passed. Uh, we're just uh, the same individuals at the core. So in 1999, I'm lined up for my first Western States 100 mile race, probably the biggest race I was competing in my life. And I just transitioned to a vegan diet that winter. And there's still doubts in my head, you know, can this really work for me? And I was thinking, you know, I probably need to eat some meat uh, here even a week up to the race. And after I won that race on a plant-based diet, there was no looking back and never doubted myself and went on to win seven consecutive Western States 100 mile races. Scott Jurek was the pioneer vegan runner and now we're starting to hear more and more it being more mainstream. Last year, Scott, after running the Appalachian Trail, which is over like 2,000 miles across 14 states, covering elevation changes of 500,000 feet, <laughs> broke the Appalachian Trail record by over three hours. There are a lot of parallels of, you know, ultra marathoning and becoming vegan. You, you don't just jump right into it. Sometimes you need to, you know, find that community. You need to try it out for, um, I tell people to try it out for at least a month to give it, give them some time to, for your body to adapt uh, to a different cuisine, different diet. Uh, your body's not quite used to it. It takes a few weeks for the human body to adapt to things. That's usually why they tell people to go to, to uh, re rehabilitation, for example, for 28 days is so their body can adapt to the new lifestyle. Oh, you just want your belly rub, don't you? You just want your belly rub. <laughs> There's definitely a correlation between the spiritual practice of non-harming and veganism and the way I'm living today compared to the way I used to live. The way I used to live was very harmful to myself, to my body, to my loved ones. Essentially, I'm trying to live a more spiritual life. And for me, that involves trying to cause as little suffering as possible and to try to just do my best. And this is very much in alignment with how I'm living today and how I want to live.
this idea of eating animal product, nothing more harmful than that shit. What's more harmful than destroying the planet and taking all the resources and then poisoning yourself? You know, the first chakra, don't poison yourself, right? Take care of yourself so you can serve the planet. So the first thing you do is you're poisoning yourself because the way the animal product is being manufactured, for one, aside from the fact that, you know, plant-based diet is safer and healthier no matter what, but the way they make the animal product, the way it's born into, talk about suffering, 100 billion animals made to be born into suffering. So, yeah, we don't want to cause any harm. So if we really examine Ahimsa and it's, an, it's, it's a meaning or if we want to be people who practice Ahimsa or cause less harm, the one thing we shouldn't do, I mean, the first and most important thing we should do is get away from eating animal product. You can do whatever you want. You can create any world you want when you're painting, right? Nothing is wrong when you're painting. See this little vine over here? You can make a monkey anywhere you want. Genesis, what's your favorite? A pig. A pig? Mm -hmm. So you guys know what abstract art means? Uh, no. Art for Animals Sake's mission is to teach art classes with an animal empathy theme. So we try to instill compassion for animals through art projects. And the reason why we use art, it gives youth especially uh, a meaningful way of looking at the issues that we're talking about. So we try to get kids to come to their own conclusions about animals and how they should be treated. Somebody once famously said if you gave a kid a bunny rabbit and an apple, they're going to eat the apple and play with the bunny rabbit. You know, so it's just sort of like this thing gets knocked out of us as we get older. One of the projects that we did was a lantern project, and we were basically um, protesting an animal experimentation lab. And so we just made these beautiful handmade lanterns. We had over 280 people from across the United States ship them to us. And we put them in a public place, and people saw these lanterns, and they, were, they gravitated to it because it was such a beautiful display. And they said, what is this all about? And we said, well, actually, every one of these lanterns represents one of these animals that is going to be... Um, experimented on in this lab that they're going to be building soon. And so by putting something beautiful in the world and enticing a conversation, I think brings people in instead of revolting them or putting them on the defensive. With Genesis and her age group, I think they're really benefiting from this age because the information's out there and it's whether they want to recognize it, they want to see it, and she has become such a good spokesperson because she has a strong feeling, but she also has sort of the background and the education, um, whether she's gotten it on her own or through her parents, to put it into practice. And I think that's why she's become such a powerful uh, uh, spokesperson at this age, because people see the innocence, but they also see the maturity and the intellectual maturity that she brings to the subject. And it's really hard to you know, talk to a kid and have them say these things that are so basic and so unfiltered and refute it. You just can't. He was spending the night one night and he's like, what are we gonna eat because you guys are vegan? And we're like, well, what do you like? He said, I like meatball subs. So he said, well, we'll serve you that. So then I was talking to him about veganism and then my mom made his sandwich, he ate it, and he's like, mm, this is really good. So then after that, he left, and then his mom called back. He's like, Tahir wants to go vegan now. And that was the happiest thought I've ever thought. David Carter, NFL defensive lineman, 300 pound vegan. Genesis Butler, quarterback, 75 pound vegan. Crush you like a little bug, but I don't crush bugs because I'm vegan. Got insurance means you're going to need it.
Hey, good game, Genesis. Thanks. Those were just some of my basic moves. Next time I'll show you some of my real moves. You know, you talk a lot of trash. <laughs> These boys challenged me to a push-off, and my mom sent me in this cute little white sparkly blouse, and then the boys do like 10 push-ups, and then like, oh, I can't take it anymore. And then I'm like, okay, so I can do more. I did 100 push-ups, and then I come home, my shirt's all dirty. It's all like black, and my mom's like, what happened? I'm like, I did push-ups, and I did it on the blacktop. And she's like, <laughs> next time, scoot over to the grass a little bit. And she had to throw it away. It was just... Oh, man. I feel sorry for those boys. That must have been a real shot to their ego, huh? When I first started going vegan, I met this 72-year-old guy. His name is Victorious Kovinskis, and I was doing like 100 push-ups, and I thought I was doing a lot. Mm -hmm. But for me, that's what I thought at that time was a lot. But he was doing 200 push-ups at 72 years old in one time. So that was like our little competition. And now I'm doing like 500 push-ups. So they were messing with you, huh? All the guys thinking that because you were vegan, you couldn't do push-ups and you mm -hmm. beat them and you obliterate them. Yeah, that happened to me. See, everybody was thinking because I was going vegan that I was gonna be all weak and small and stuff and never be able to play again. But I did lose some weight. I got down to 265, but then I put on another 40 pounds of just solid muscle. And now I'm stronger than all of them. So. Vegan is clearly the best way to go. You know that too. And those little boys who you beat in the push-up contest, they know that too now. Oh, so another thing your mom told me about was the football game when you showed up in ballerina shoes. Oh, so I came from a circus protest and um, we thought it was my brother's game, so it was gonna be all right. And he was in his jersey, he was, he was ready. I come, my team's all, they're like, come on, where were you? I'm like. And then I had like my Save the Elephant shirt on. I had everything on, all my, all my protest stuff. So then they make this 12 alligator rule. It was just like five alligator first. So now it goes up to 12 because I was pulling flags like that. I remember when I was playing Pop Winter, yeah. it was the defensive line had to wait five alligators before we could go rush the quarterback. So. You, they, like, had, they, they pushed it up because of you to 12 alligators? Like, you were supposed to do for five alligators, one alligator, two alligator, three alligators, all the way to five. So then they pushed it up to 12, so that's like half of the game. The game's almost over. Genesis, count two more alligators. Fight! One alligator, two alligator, three alligator, four alligator, five. So then I do 12 alligators. Go get them! But I still catch their flag, so couldn't do nothing about it. So they tried to cheat to mm -hmm. stop you from sticking to, taking their flags and they still ended up looking bad. And there were some big guys too. Man, how many touchdowns did you score that game? Five to zero. Wait, so the score was five to zero. Who mm -hmm. scored all, you scored all the touchdowns? So you scored, <laughs> you scored, and hey, this is all boys, right? You're playing against all yeah, boys. I'm the only girl. All meat eaters and you're the only girl and you're the only vegan and you scored all the touchdowns and they had to push the alligators up to 12, mm -hmm. from five alligators to 12 alligators, just to stop you from snatching all the flags. Man, shoot, you're doing a better job than me with all this football stuff. That's right, girl. We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe, we shall overcome someday. We'll walk hand in hand, we'll walk hand in hand, we'll walk hand in hand, we'll walk hand in hand someday. Deep in my heart, I do believe, we shall overcome someday. You are not alone, you are not alone. You are not alone today. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday.
I also don't like to use the word typical vegan because I don't know what a typical vegan is anymore. I don't know if there's such a thing. I think that sort of 70s version of the tree-hugging, crystal-powered, Birkenstock-wearing unicorn rider is, is sort of nonsense and has been for a long time. I left home right after college and I ended up walking actually all the way from New England to Tennessee. And I ended up at, in Tennessee at a community called The Farm, which at that time was the largest hippie commune in the world. There was about a, almost a thousand people there and they were all vegetarians. In fact, we would today call them vegans. No one heard of the word vegan in 1975. I fought competitively for many, many years. Uh, I still train and I, I, there's, there's nothing more satisfying than getting into the ring with a guy who's 20 years younger than I am and just completely handing him his ass. Nine years later, I shaved my head and for the second time in my life, I found myself in a uh, community that was vegan. This was Sangwang Sa Zen Monastery in South Korea. And I went there and became a Zen monk uh, with the idea of doing an intensive meditation. And uh, I realized though that these people in this monastery had been living what we would call a vegan way of living for 750 years. I can remember one of my health coaches who was super traditional, he's about a thousand years old, old Chinese guy, who used to say, you gotta be more aggressive, you gotta eat more meat, you know, you gotta eat more meat and be more aggressive. So there was no meat, no dairy, no eggs, no wool, no silk, no leather, even mosquitoes you wouldn't just you know, kill, you would put them outside. <laughs> and then at the same time, he would sit us all down for two-hour meditations and say, walk the middle path and uh, embrace, you know, freedom and, and um, balance. Now get in there and kick that guy's ass and bring home a trophy for the school. The whole idea was um, that if we want to evolve in consciousness and become more awake, then the fundamental, most important thing is kindness to others. And, and it's that same sort of cognitive dissonance that says I can, you know, pet my dog and love my golden retriever and then I can eat a double bacon cheeseburger. Um, and it has simply never made sense to me. We are all interconnected. The interconnectedness of life is the fundamental spiritual teaching. And from understanding that more deeply, we liberate ourselves as we liberate others. We're all on this crazy rock flying through the universe and we're in it together. And I know it sounds, again, it sounds a little crystal powered, but it's really the only thing that, that we know for sure, which is that we're all adrift in a sea of chaos, you know? And the mountain is not there and me and the trees are here. I am the trees and I am the mountain and we are all on the rock together. And, and, and that is the more sublime change that happens after one realizes that we can't slaughter and eat our fellow earthlings. The whole idea of veganism is really a social transformation, but also a personal transformation based on awakening out of the delusion of being a fundamentally separate self and competing with others to get something, to rather to see that as we bless others, we are blessed. Four Amy's with no cheese, that would be completely vegan? Um, yeah, but we also can do, um, if you get four vegan Amy's, I can do them with vegan cheese. Oh, okay. Well, actually, you know what? I think I'm fine without the cheese, vegan okay. or not. But that, wow, that's great. That's good to know. Okay. About four Amy's with no cheese? Four Amy's, no cheese. All and right. then I need two non-dairy chocolate and two non-dairy strawberries. Back in the day in 1970, when I first became a vegan, you know, a lot of those veggie meats, I won't name the brand because they're good people that tried hard, but uh, you know, they were, you know, I'm not sure if that veggie meat was good for your body, but it certainly wasn't good for your soul. You know, it was kind of like, well, I'm just gonna eat this anyway. It was kind of the, uh, the inner monologue whenever you would eat some of that stuff, but it got so much better over the years and now, you know, you can go to any restaurant and they have vegan dishes. You know, nearly any restaurant has that. And they're delicious. And people realize just because you're a, a vegan doesn't mean you don't like flavor. Garlic is just fine. You know, cayenne pepper is just fine. Ginger is wonderful. You know, put some flavor into it. And that's what I do when I cook. I make a number of wonderful dishes. I have a 
spicy Thai basil eggplant I make. I make a wonderful curry. I have a, a chicken with peanut sauce with fake chicken, of course. You know, Trinidad squash, uh, Greek potatoes. I have all these wonderful dishes filled with flavor that people, big meat eaters that come to my house, they love it. And they begrudgingly go meat free for the day, but then when it's done, when the meal's done, they go, you know what, I could do this again. I may do this a little more often. That's exciting. I'm a vegan sitting in a drive-through ordering a burger and a shake and fries. Very cool. I didn't fully understand the green aspects of it back in 1970, but by the early 90s I did. You know, it takes so much more land and water and uh, energy to create a pound of beef than it does a pound of broccoli or a pound of grain. So it's the green choice in many ways, land use, energy, water, you name it. Right now on my truck it says vegan. Uh, I'm really considering rebranding into plant-based because I am finding that that is more accessible to people. Uh, they're, it's the same thing, it's the same food, but unfortunately I think that over time vegan has created a whole other layering of, of uh, meaning, which sometimes can mean militant and people get defensive, like, you know, oh, you're going to tell me how to live my life or whatever. There's no joy in being right about climate change or being a vegan or single-use plastic, you know, some of these things that we've been talking about for many years, but I would hope that people would be more open to these points of view now that there's been a great success rate about a lot of the things we've been talking about. You know, right here in LA and in several other cities, solar power is now on a par with, you know, the traditional grid power of coal and natural gas and all of that. It's now cost effective to do solar. So that's a big game changer. So now maybe people will be open to these kinds of things and dietary choices that you can make that will be good for the environment and good for your own health. When I use the term plant-based, I find people just open up. You can just, oh, yay, yeah, I love plants. That's good, you know. And, and when I use the term vegan, oftentimes, I just see them kind of close up. So it's, hey, you know, I want to use what works. I mean, if, if people are going to be more open to the word plant-based or words plant-based as opposed to the word vegan, sure, I'll do it. As long as I eat my food, that's all I care about. I don't care how they get there. I just want them to get there and, uh, and then understand what it's about. And then, then the discussion about veganism can hopefully come into play. I mean, baby steps, right? Whatever works. What do we do as activists that actually reaches people and that actually changes the world? You know, screaming is fun. Throwing fake blood is really satisfying but it doesn't change the world, doesn't make the world a better place for animals. It just satisfies our emotional need to scream and throw fake blood, you know? So in being a, a vegan activist and being an animal rights activist, the criteria by which my actions are, actions are judged is how effective am I at being an activist for animals? You know, not how much I enjoy it, not how much I want to scream, because I just want to scream at everybody, but Am I making the world a better place through my activism for the animals? My grandfather's a butcher, grew up in Kansas, uh, you know, meat eating, meat eating, meat eating family. And here it was almost in the middle of the night, and I hear this wailing coming from the barn. It's pouring down rain and whatever, so I put on my big old rubber boots and go on down there and storms happening outside and it's cold and it's dark and it's it was an experience like you can't imagine unless you live through it I think you know I mean I've I've birthed my own babies um, but I'm a little distracted but here I'm watching the miracle of life just happen right in front of me and my hands are right there and I'm in there and I'm I'm actually inside this this lamb pulling out the baby and and um, it was just a really beautiful moment.
watching the, the baby grow up, you know, you almost feel a connection like, like I would with a child of my own. You know, I, it, it changed me um, in my thoughts about food, um, especially to the, the day that, um, that she was killed, I wasn't home um, by design. I knew she was going to be. Um, that was the plan from the beginning. That was our structure. That's what we did. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was tough that day. But my background uh, has always been, you know, that this is the this is life. This is this is the way things are, and this is. Um, so my feelings were wrong. You know, I I needed to buck it up. I needed to to um, get with the program and stop being so emotional about it, and and feed my family, and that was kind of the attitude of things. And um, so I, I, I cooked dinner um, a short time later using this baby um, and cried for days. It, Vibrating to eternal rhythms Where the mysteries unfold magically Every year for Thanksgiving we do a celebration for the turkeys where the turkeys are the guests of honor. The turkeys dig in, they love pumpkin pie and uh, they stick their face right into it and <laughs> splatter it all around. There's a memory of another space Time. I'm on my way to soaring into the light. She said, Mom, I got the pig, I got the pig. Oh, good, good. And she says, and I named it Herman. I said, oh, you did not. After your dad. She said, I did too. I said, what's your pig? Brace your heart, go forth, share the mystery. The world's ready now for you to do what you're here to do. The planetary signs are in line, girl, you're right on time. Some children want to go vegan, but the mom and dad don't have enough courage to do it. So I'm very, very blessed and lucky to have them. And I think these are the best parents that a child can ask for. There's a memory of another space in time. I'm on my way to soaring into the light. I'm resonating to the sound, to the sound, to the sound. To the trees, to the breeze, to the waters, to the oceans, to the streams, to the sea, to the sound, to the sound. The cage of chickens fell off a transport into Memorial Park and broke open, and all of them but one were killed. One of them had one of her wings ripped off and was lying there mostly dead. To the sound. So I went and picked this chicken up and, um, and took her to the shelter, took her to our vets, took her to an avian vet, and she 
we fostered her. We named her Isabel and got to know her. It became impossible to ignore that we had to take the next step. And my partner and I had both had brushes with being vegan. We'd been vegetarian for years. But this, for us, Isabel's face was on it. To the sound. This isn't a question about eggs. This is a question about Isabel. And that's a really easy answer. Om Namah Shivaya. Could you look an animal in its face and simply say to it that your appetite is more important than its suffering? You know, that your desire to eat it is more important than its desire to be alive? Houdini <laughs> has fallen in love with the uh, Herman the pig. Oh, yeah. I was out there earlier, nobody else was around, and they were just nose to nose. Mm -hmm. And I watched them a little while, and, and they just, I don't know what they were saying to each other, but they were, uh, they were communicating. experience of somebody that gets dragged to my truck by somebody else generally that understands and then they try it and it's it's just so cool and then they come always come to the window that's what we have the best customers because they're always coming to the window after they eat saying thank you for being here it was so good and things like that and, and it's just they're just very generous people you know it's nice I'm 65 years of age and I ride my bike all over LA still. I'm in great shape and I've been to my high school reunion and I can tell you it's better to be a vegan. <laughs>